In Revelation 17, John saw in a vision a woman sitting on a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. Who is she? And what is the meaning of this vision? If you use the correct keys, the Bible interprets itself. Francois will now help us to unlock Revelation 17. In our previous lecture, we looked at the seven last plagues and noticed some interesting similarities between them and the plagues that were poured out on Egypt just before the Exodus. We also had an in-depth look at the sixth plague when we studied about Armageddon. We discovered that it is not going to be a literal war between nations of this planet in a literal place called Megiddo in Israel. It is logistically impossible to gather all the armies of the world into this small valley of Megiddo. It is so sad to think that so many people are misled by what they hear about Armageddon. The devil is a very shrewd deceiver and we should study the Bible more earnestly and prayerfully. Let's do some revision as we read from Revelation 16 verse 12. It says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. You see, the sixth angel wants to lead our minds far away from this valley of Megiddo to the historic drying up of the Euphrates in ancient Babylon. The only river near Megiddo is not the Euphrates, but the little Kishon River where Elijah killed the wicked priests of Baal. What happened anciently when the Euphrates dried up? Only if we know the facts will we be able to understand the meaning of the sixth plague. In 539 BC, a mysterious hand wrote strange words on the palace walls in Babylon. Mini, mini, tikel, yufarsun. You have been weighed and found wanting. That same night the Euphrates, which flowed through the city, dried up, and Cyrus entered and captured the city through the dry riverbed. Revelation 16 verse 12 mentions the kings that came from the east. In order to understand the meaning of these kings of the east, we will have to study the history of Cyrus and Darius who conquered Babylon from the east and set the captives free. As we've discovered earlier, Cyrus is a type of Christ who will come from the rising of the sun, the east, and deliver us from captivity. But before Christ comes, the waters of the Euphrates will dry up and Babylon must fall. What is the meaning of waters? Verse 15 of chapter 17 explains and says, Then the angels said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations and languages. Can you think of another name for these waters? The Euphrates. So what the sixth plague actually tells me is that the human support which the apostate religious systems of the world enjoy at this moment will one day dry up, mystic Babylon will fall and then Jesus will come. What kind of deception will precede the drying up of the Euphrates and the fall of Babylon? Chapter 16 mentions it and chapter 17 explains it. Verses 13 and 14 Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Verses 15 and 16 Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Do you still remember who the dragon is? Revelation 12, 9 says it is the devil. Now this is very serious. He's going to manifest himself through agencies like spiritualistic mediums and he's going to change himself into an angel of light. The other two deceivers will be the beast, which is the papacy, and the false prophet, which is America, representing all apostate Protestantism. 
Demonic spirits will work through this unholy trio and gather the entire world at a place called Armageddon, which is a state of mind in which they are prepared to kill God's people. One of the reasons why these persecutors are so furious is because they've received the mark of the beast and suffers the consequences of their disobedience, which is the seven last plagues. God's obedient children, on the other hand, receive the seal of God and they are being protected from the plagues. Remember, it's the devil's plan to exterminate all of God's children. They will be blamed for the falling of the terrible plagues. But God is not going to allow his people to be massacred at this stage. They had their share of persecution through the ages. This time the persecutors will feel his wrath. Let's read about it. Verses 17 to 21. The seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the earthquake. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, fell upon men. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Let's see how the Old Testament explains the events of the sixth and seventh plagues in type. This is an ancient site near Gibeon in Israel. In the time of Joshua, a mighty coalition marched against Israel to destroy them. And what happened here is typical of what is going to happen during the seventh plague. Joshua was fighting this war with all his might, but the sun was setting too fast for him to obtain a complete victory. And then he prayed this prayer which is recorded in Joshua 10 verse 12. O sun, stand still over Gibeon. While you're looking at this old water cistern at Gibeon, I'm reading from verse 11. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. The story of the enemy coalition who wanted to destroy God's people serves as an example of how God is going to deal with his end-time enemies. And the end-time enemies will also be a demonic coalition wanting to destroy his people. Hailstones will again destroy the enemies of God's people. Job also predicted the stoning of the world by hail, as we've studied previously. And now for the woman on the beast. I'm going to read carefully from Revelation 17 and see if you recognize who she is. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert. Then I saw a woman sitting on the scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Well, there she is. The Bible calls her a prostitute. In other words, she violates her marriage vows. She's also a lawbreaker. Now, in the Bible, a woman represents a church. The true church, God's remnant church, is represented by a pure woman. She keeps the commandments of God and holds to the testimony of Jesus. We studied about her in our lecture on Revelation chapter 12. 
But this woman does not keep God's commandments. She is a false church. Which church changed God's law? She sits on many waters. Verse 17 says, waters represent people. Which church has millions upon millions of followers today? The Roman Catholic Church. Verse 4 says, she is dressed in purple and scarlet. And this is what you see when you visit Rome. Roman Catholic clergymen are dressed in these colours. And of course they don't like you taking pictures of them while they attend a Mass conducted by the Pope himself in St. Peter's as you can see on this picture. Verse 4 says, She was glittering with gold, precious stone and pearls. You have to visit Rome to see the fulfilment of this prophecy. The attire of the harlot corresponds to that of the ancient high priest. What does that tell you? He usurps the high priestly role of Christ. She held a golden cup in her hand, says verse 4. I discovered something very interesting that I would like to share with you. In 1825, Pope Leo XII produced a medal. On one side he presented himself. And on the other side he presented his church. A woman with a cup in her hand. One does not have to guess as to which church Revelation 17 is talking about. There are too many evidences pointing to the papacy in this prophecy. Revelation 17.5 says, This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Would you like to see this title in solid stone? Come with me to St. John Lateran in Rome, just opposite Santa Scala, where members earn their forgiveness by climbing these steps on their knees. It's written in Latin, but you can translate it into English, and then it reads, Church Mother and Head of all the churches of the city of the world. She says she is the Mother. Who are her daughters? Well, those who believe her doctrines. In the Angus Cathedral in France, they discovered a huge tapestry of the Apocalypse, that is the book of Revelation. It was made between 1375 and 1380. It's two eight four meters long and a half meter deep. This is a representation of the dragon of Revelation 12 handing over power to the beast of Revelation 13. Pagan and papal Rome. And here we have the harlot on the beast with a cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries, as verse 4 says. What exactly are the contents of this cup? Revelation 14.8 says it is the maddening wine of her adulteries. In other words, her false doctrine. For instance, she teaches that God is love but at the same time she teaches that he punishes people in purgatory and eventually in hellfire that will burn forever and ever and ever. Inside St. Peter's you can visit this stone door. Once in 25 years the Pope takes a golden hammer, knocks here and all the souls in purgatory escape. When I looked at this little golden hammer, I thought of how many churches were made drunk by the wine of Babylon's teaching that God punishes people throughout eternity. On the one hand, they teach that the Bible is the word of God, but when they want to change it to suit them, they place tradition above the Bible. During the Council of Trent in 1562, they openly declared that tradition stands above the Bible. Protestants sipped from this Babylonian wine and became intoxicated. Modern literature reveals the shocking fact that in many ways they too place tradition above the Bible. On the one hand, the Catholic Church teaches that the Ten Commandments are morally binding, but on the other hand, they change the Sabbath to Sunday. The churches of the world drank the wine of this false doctrine and became intoxicated. They are so drunk that they cannot tell you which day of the week is the Sabbath of the Lord. In 54 places the Bible says that when a person dies he sleeps the sleep of death and he remains in that condition till Jesus comes. No, says the Church of Rome, you don't die, as the serpent told Eve, you keep on living, either in purgatory 
or in hell or in heaven. She holds a cup in her hand full of false doctrines. The churches of the world drank from that cup and are intoxicated with the wine of Babylon. What a sad situation. Revelation chapter 17 and we'll read from verse 6. I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. In the first six verses of this chapter, 102 words are devoted to the woman and only 12 to the beast. But in verses 7 to 18, the angel dwells almost entirely on the beast, together with its heads and horns. Only 36 words are devoted to the woman and 243 to the beast. The brief triumph and sudden fall of the woman can be understood only by a careful study of the contribution made by the beast. Let's look at Revelation 17 verses 9 and 10 and study the characteristics of the beast. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. He says the seven heads are seven hills or mountains and they are also seven kings. We will have to go to the Old Testament to discover the symbolic meaning of a mountain. Jeremiah 51 verses 24 and 25 says, Before your eyes I will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylon for all the wrong they have done in Zion. In the study we did on Daniel 7, we discovered that the lion represents Babylon. But now the Bible uses another symbol to represent Babylon. Could it be a mountain? Yes, it is. Let's read about it. I am against you, O destroying mountain, you who destroy the whole earth, declares the Lord. That's verse 25. Babylon is called a destroying mountain. This study becomes exciting. Those seven heads on the beast represent seven kingdoms that wanted to destroy God's people throughout the ages. Who were they? The scope of this lecture does not allow us to do an in-depth study. But the very first kingdom that wanted to destroy God's people was the Egyptian kingdom. Then came the mighty Assyrian Empire and for years they were the destroying mountains that attacked God's people. You are looking at the actual relief of the capture of one of the Israelite fortified cities by the Assyrians called Lachish. The Assyrians were the second destroying mountains who wanted to annihilate Israel. And of course you are familiar with the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. Question. During which head or destroying mountain or kingdom did John live? Rome, of course. Which number is Rome, the sixth. Verse 10 says, Five have fallen, which were they? Well, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece. And then the verse continues and says, One is, who was this one head that existed during John's time? Well, it was the Roman Empire. What number was he? The sixth. Verse 10 says, Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. Who was still to come, looking from John's time perspective? The papacy, are you still with me? John says in AD 95, five kingdoms that persecuted God's people have fallen. One exists, the Roman Empire. By implication, he too will fall. And who will be the seventh? the papacy, and by implication he too will fall. 
And now for the most dramatic revelation in this entire chapter. Let's read verses 8 and 11 which speak about the beast. Listen carefully. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come out of the abyss and go to his destruction. Verse 11 explains, The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. You have just read a description of the life story of the devil. He once was one of the cherubs guarding the holy law of God in heaven. He once was one of the four living creatures of which we read of in Revelation who praises God day and night. But then he sinned and became Satan and caused the ruin of our planet. It is he who is deceiving the wicked masses as well as the church leaders. Why? Because he is a murderer from the beginning and he wants to destroy as many people as possible. During the millennium, the thousand years, he will be bound. That will be his is not period. In our study of the thousand years, we will discover what will happen to Satan during the time when the earth will be depopulated and destroyed. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 3 And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, which is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Did you notice the was period of the devil? This is before he's captured during the thousand years. Do you notice the is not period when he goes into the abyss? And do you notice that he will also come out of the abyss? This will be the will be period period. Let's look again at verse 8 of chapter 17. It says, The beast, that's a devil, which you saw once was, that's in paradise, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. Revelation 20.10 says that the devil will eventually be destroyed in the lake of fire. We will one day be astonished when we see his destruction. What a dramatic prophecy. We still have to identify the ten horns, but this is going to be exciting. Something dramatic is going to happen. Verses 12 to 14. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. This prophecy is repeating what all the previous prophecies predicted. The democratic countries of the world will become autocratic. They, in cooperation with the fallen churches, will make an onslaught on God's children. This is the so-called New World Order. It comprises of the devil, the apostate churches, and the world authorities and the masses. But then something dramatic happens. At some stage, the kings realize that the woman and the beast have misled them. They suddenly realize that they have fought a lost battle against God and his people. Verses 16 and 17. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. Revelation 16.11 predicted the drying up of the Euphrates. Here we have the fulfillment. One author gave this very vivid description of this event. The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. 
Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. This comes from the Great Controversy, pages 655 and 656. We must ask ourselves, are we still part of Babylon, part of a religious system that has been intoxicated by the wine of the false doctrine of Rome? The book of Revelation says there is no future in Babylon, only dangerous destruction. Let's read about the appeal to come out of Babylon. Revelation 18, after this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I'm not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Probation is about to close. God wants to come and fetch his children. Maybe he's lingering a little longer for you and me to get ready. But he who promised that he would come will come again. And it's going to be a glorious day. So what does it matter if we suffer a little persecution? Why shouldn't we deny our fleshly lusts? If we yield to the dictates of our fallen human natures, it's only going to bring remorse and unhappiness. Really, there is only one thing worth living for, and that is preparing for the second coming of Christ. I want to be ready. What about you? Thank you, Francois. When reading the Bible, I continually ask myself, am I honest with myself and am I honest with God? If I'm not in line with God's will, I will have to make the changes, even if it's painful. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the time of grace, a time when we can make changes. Help us not to be part of Babylon, but to hear your plea to come out of Babylon and be saved. Bless us as we make our decisions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.